This is the Bates Bobcast, our weekly podcast where we take a look at the week that was in Bates Athletics. My name is Aaron Morse, and this week we're recapping the Bates basketball seasons and looking ahead to lacrosse. Plus, the swimming and diving teams turned in outstanding performances at the NASCAC Championships. All that and more coming up on the Bates Bobcast. <laughs> Two weekends ago, the women's swimming and diving team finished fourth at the NASCAC Championships, with head coach Peter Casares earning Conference Coach of the Year honors for the second time in his career. Junior Caroline Apathy defended her NASCAC title in the 100-yard butterfly, and first-year Gabby Smart was named NASCAC Rookie of the Year after she took home the conference title in the 200-yard backstroke and took second in both 500 free and 400 IM. And Gabby Smart is our female Bobcat of the Week. First of all, 200-yard backstroke. NESCAC champion, take us through that, that final and what it was like touching the wall first there. I was really nervous going into it because I think I was seeded third, and there was a Williams girl first, and then my our um, senior on the team, Hannah, and she, in the morning we had both had great swims and both gone NCAA B cuts, which was really good. Um, but I was just really nervous because I was – my, goal, my one goal for this year was to try to win the two back. And so I was really I – I couldn't see Hannah, but I was mainly just trying to beat the Williams girl next to me because I think they had won almost every other event. And I was like, okay, they have to not win one event. So I just was really trying to beat the Williams girl. Um, but it was a super fun race, and um, both Hannah and I, I think, did really well. And like so now we're both going to NCAAs most likely to swim it again. So – get another shot and see if we can both do even better, which is really exciting. Certainly. So in a 200-yard race like that, are you really tracking where the Williams girl is the whole time, or is it only down the stretch maybe? Um, Not the whole time. I'm no. not particularly a very race person. I like to my own race. Right, um, right. So I was just focusing, but just so much because I was obviously trying to go for, like, a vest time and all that. Um, But I guess just kind of subtly in the – back of my mind just keeping an eye on where she was yeah um but really i just kind of trying to give it like all i have and all you have and give it your best is i think the most important thing so peter was telling me you got you got second in the 500 free and in the 400 im you were second both times though to someone who had won the national championship the previous year in those events did you know that going in that it was going to be that type of competition um no i mean i don't really look into that type of stuff uh-huh. i just kind of went in Thing I'd swim my own race and yeah. see how it went, and I, Laura and Molly, I believe they're both super nice afterwards mm. and welcomed me to the nest cack, and so it was fun getting to like race next to somebody who is so talented and is so accomplished, um, and then kind of being able to like use them and try to keep up with them, and so it's it's good to have people like that. But going into it, I didn't I had. I knew they were fast, yeah. but I didn't know they were that fast. <laughs> right, right. So you mentioned the possibility of NCAA is coming up. Um, we find out officially who's going in what on Wednesday. But what are your thoughts on uh, on that and how you're going to prepare? You know, because that's that's still March, right? You still got a few weeks. Yeah. Um. I, yeah. I think in our relays we have a really, really yeah. good shot of going, and then hopefully in my individual events, um, I'll be able to go. But I think there's 11 girls that we're planning are going to go, which is a really big group. I think it's the biggest group we've had, which is so exciting. Um, So we'll keep training, but it'll be really nice since we have a bigger group. It'll be a really fun training group, and we'll still do kind of – we kind of – we tapered, and now we have to train really hard and kind of build back up our endurance and all that. So we'll have probably this week and next week will be fairly hard training weeks so we can build back up, and then we'll – kind of start coming back down and resting a little bit more um, right before nationals so we can be sure that we when we suit up, we have a really good meet. Yeah, so the women's NESCAC was two weeks ago. This past weekend was the men's NESCAC. Uh, was the women's team, you know, going down there to, to watch that, or are you, you back here still training and stuff? Um, we stayed – a couple of girls went. Uh-huh. Um, they went um, – so I think there's three that tried to get right. national cuts, and they were so close. They had really uh, good races. Um, yeah. And then some other people went and watched. But most of us stayed here, and we just watched the live stream in the cafeteria, <laughs> probably getting lots of looks as we're screaming, and people are looking at us like, what are they doing? and what is going on but it was a really really fun meet to watch because they got fourth and i 
they hadn't got that in a while or if ever. ever. Right. Yeah, which yeah. is super, super exciting. They totally deserve it because they've all the men have worked really hard and it was really fun to like watch them get that. What was the past week like for you coming off of NESCAX? Was there training involved or was it real tapering? Or how does that go, I guess, kind of? Um, well, we had Monday and Tuesday off, which okay. was nice to kind of get a yeah, little break. Yeah, right. Kind of <laughs> just take a breath, come back down. Um, but then Wednesday we started training again. Mm. And then um, the, all the coaches left Thursday. But we still came in Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to train. so we can. And then we had Sunday off. But we've. Jumped right back Jumped in, right basically. Back in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so your first NESCAC experience, kind of, I mean, it's a different type of meet. What were some impressions you had of, of what you saw there? Um, I think it was very interesting and a, such a fun meet. But we, because there's men's and women's NESCACs, they're separate meets. Right. But most conferences are combined. So I think it's really cool to have, while it is fun to compete with the men, and like that's kind of what nationals was for, mm-hmm. but having a women's meet where you, you know you're surrounded by a bunch of other really fast hard working women is super super fun and like you know like supporting like I said um, the Williams girls like both like welcome me to the NESCAC and were like talking to me and saying how excited they were which is like super nice of them and knowing like we're not on the same team but you can still like be friendly with people and have friends on other teams um, which is really cool and then also just being Bates as a women's team is really cool because you know that you've trained with these girls and they're there to race and do the best they can and like getting behind the blocks and cheering like every race and that was like the expectation which is super fun and like watching people swim and watching people do really well and then seeing their reactions and getting out and hugging them after which is like super super fun and just like being a part of that team is really really rewarding and a great experience and you get to look forward to seeing some of the, more of those uh, williams women i'm sure at ncaa's too right yeah yeah <laughs> so that'll be more nescac reunion kind of there but um so your first year here on campus coming you know from montana we talked about last time um how you got here and everything but what's it been like so far you know the, the, as the season's gone on in terms of your adjustment to college and everything uh it's been really good i mean I, again, I still say the hardest thing is just being so far. But, yeah. I mean, having a great group of people here that make it easy, um, that are really supportive, and having good classes, I guess, helps, and a good coaching staff. So I think it's been really, really good, and I'm really enjoying it. Did you come in? You mentioned 200 back was kind of your goal from the beginning. And at, what, at what point during the year were you like, I could win the conference title in this? I never am saying, oh, I w- I'm – can do that or will do that I, it's always kind of a hope because like yeah. there's always like so there's a bunch of really fat like the NESCAC in division three is one of the top yeah conferences which is really cool so I just was said I'm going to train really hard and I'm going to try to do my personal best and see if I can better myself and then in the process try to do like really well for the team and get points for the team but I think it was kind of like the week before P- PC and I were talking He's like, do you want to swim the mile or the two back? And I was like, hmm, mile or two back? Two back would be great Yeah, that's much shorter. And he was like, well, like, let's see, like, where you place. And he was like, well, you could get, like, second or third in the mile. And right now you're seated first in the two back. And I was like, uh, okay. So, like, I didn't – we kind of just looked at, like, what the current times were and what people went last year and went off that. And ultimately we decided to put me in the two back and kind of just see how it went. So. The mile, wow! So that's that's I mean that's a distance event. Yeah. So you 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 kind of do it all, don't you? It seems like. Um, I mean, I do whatever is needed. Like yeah. Whatever coach needs me to do, I'll do. But the 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 when when you're approaching something like the mile, I mean that that's totally different strategy than a two bat. I mean, it's kind of a comparable event, really. Oh right? n- no, yeah. not really. <laughs> uh, they're very different, but I kind of. I, I was kind of all the place. I was kind of an IMR, and then I was a distance swimmer, and now I'm kind of becoming a backstroker, mm. but still kind of an IMR distance yeah. swimmer. So, and I think just having a good like training endurance base kind of enables like people to do a variety of things. Awesome. Well, your thoughts on uh, the NESCAC championships and then the possibilities of NCAA's that you wanted to share? Um, no, I just. I think if we just had both the men's and women's teams. I want to like applaud all of us and everybody for doing so amazing. And being a part of the team has been a really, really great experience. And I'm very lucky to be a part of this team. And so I'm really, really excited for future years because I think, especially at NESCAX, I mean, obviously Williams won and then Tufts and Amherst, but in previous year, like we were really close to Amherst, which I think kind of puts the pressure on them a little bit because mm. they were kind of like, whoa, like. <laughs> 
Bates is kind of coming up here because I think in previous years we've been kind of fairly far behind in points wise, but we were right up there this year with the top schools. So I think it's it'll be really really cool to see what we can do in the coming years. Sounds good, Gabby Smart, female Bobcat of the Week. Thanks so much. Thank you. This past weekend, it was the men's swimming and diving team's chance to compete at the NESCAC Championships. And the Bobcats set a new standard for the program by placing fourth at the meet. Sophomore Andrew Hall placed third in the 400 IM, earning all NESCAC honors. He also helped Bates place fourth in the 800 free relay, fourth in the 400 medley relay, and fourth in the 200 medley relay. Individually, Hall placed seventh in the 200-yard breaststroke and ninth in the 200 IM. And Andrew Hall is our male Bobcat of the Week. The team morale and team dynamic was just at an all-time high, especially being so close to Colby. The score was within like 50 or even less, like 30 points throughout the entire meet. So it was very exciting to come result in a finish on top of them, like above them, yeah. A little little bit deja vu because you were so close with Colby in the dual meet you had, right? (laughs) came down to the last... Uh, relay or last two events and that was like the same thing as last year the score was actually even closer last year but Bowden was uh, way ahead of us last year and this year we came on top of Bowden and mm-hmm. then um you know kind of tracking the scores I mean heading into the final day what were your kind of thoughts going through your mind about what what needed to happen uh getting to the final day I was tired I I was swimming a lot but I'm like I actually get the most excited the last day, because, like, wow, the season's coming to an end. It's a weird feeling, but also exciting. Like, I have to get, I have to race my hardest and race my heart out for the team. And I guess I, I'm sure everyone else feels the same way. And then you got all NESCAC in the 400 mm-hmm. IM. Um, what, what does that mean to you to, to, ha- to earn that top three finish like that? Oh, it's awesome. Um, it's very exciting. I actually wanted to do better, a better time. Mm. I wanted to break the four minute, uh, like the the hump over four minutes, but it was awesome that I got third place. Um, I didn't think I'd be that high up last year. I was sixth, mm. and this year it was the event overall was a little slower, and I got a best time and broke the school record once again. But which is very exciting. But um, yeah, I wanted to get over that hump of four minutes. That that leaves you hungry for uh, next year, doesn't it? Next year, it? definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the race is very close to mm. the top four people were within half a second, which is which is pretty crazy for a meet uh, an event rather. Uh, so pretty long, like four hundred right. yards. Yeah, usually um, a fifty or a hundred ends up with times being within uh, half a second. So Not coming right, right. Yeah. So so coming into this season, um, you had to have a minor back surgery in October, mm-hmm. which is right next to when the season really kind of begins in the fall, right? What was that process like getting back to to full strength? Yeah, so the the procedure was pretty minor. I got two nerves burned in my back um, after an injury last March, and it was tough because I couldn't really do anything over the summer so I was pretty out of shape and uh, I tried doing alternative things like biking and that's probably about it and core exercises and that'll that kept my motivation going to, for this season and starting the season was rough because I couldn't do butterfly kick and I'm, I was a butterflyer on the A relays last year and I actually did the 200 fly instead of the 200 breast the last day mm. at Nezcax. And uh, that was a big point scorer. And uh, so I couldn't do butterfly for, I don't know, five or six weeks after the procedure. And then I slowly got back into it. And I was afraid the procedure wouldn't even work because I kept feeling some back pains, but... After doing PT for a while, I slowly got stronger and was able to do butterfly. And sure enough, I was on the A relays again, which was exciting. Yeah, yeah. what point in the year did you start to feel more 100% kind of? Um, Probably around training trip, okay. which is not an <laughs> ideal place. 
Uh, it was that, uh, well, I guess it's perfect timing and not ideal at the same right. time because <laughs> it's the hardest training. So, like, I could revert, go in reverse and get worse over training chip, but I actually got better, which is good. And this team is a nice, I think, mix. There's some seniors who are real big contributors, and you have some younger guys like yourself and, you know, first year, you know, mm-hmm. Nathan Barry coming in and making an impact. What was the dynamic kind of like on this year's team? There wasn't really, like, a separation between class. Everyone was just, like, right. one. We were one team. We were all going for one goal just to get – to do as uh, best we could and get fourth, our goal. Yeah. Um, well, the seniors w- really – led mm. which was awesome and that's really what they needed to do and everyone else was just like following them mm. which is awesome um and yeah the freshmen sophomores and juniors we all contributed like very we all tried as hard as we could to uh contribute to like points right and then for you i mean you know, there were some B cut times being being swam there by the Bobcats, but I guess it's it's tough to break into the NCAA's. I guess individually, right? I mean, it's it seems like there, but there there's definitely for you to something that's for going to next year is obviously going to be a big goal, right? Oh yeah, uh, the relays are probably easier to mm-hmm. make it in because they're there are invite times. I think it's top sixteen yeah. get invited for each event, and then if you have a B cut, you're allowed to go. Only if you have the invited time in some other event. Yeah. And the invited time is obviously very hard to get if you're top 16 in the country. And then, so I got the B cut in the 4IM and the 200 breast, but that didn't cut it for the invite time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's definitely a goal for next year. Maybe, maybe more for relays since it's easier. Mm -hmm. Get a good relay team going to get an uh invited and then swim those events at nationals that i got beat cuts in yeah how were the relays at, at nescax there for the team fast yeah they were fast <laughs> uh like some i know the 200 free relay and maybe the 200 medley relay the b relays would have beaten the a relays last year wow which is very good <laughs> yeah so they were definitely faster especially with all the freshmen like Barry, Nate Barry, yeah. and John Marcolina stepping up. So for bait specifically, the B relays this year were faster than the A's. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's that that shows a lot of um, improvement in the yeah, program, right? Definitely. Any other thoughts on on the meet and uh, what you took away from it, kind of? The uh, whole Nescac experience is unlike any other meet. Like on my club team, the meets were exciting, but they weren't like they're more individualized. Yeah. So. You you want to do your best times to for colleges to see your times only and not like your your teammates' time. I don't, it sounds kind of selfish, but mm. that's pretty much the end goal to on club swimming. But here the end goal is like do it for your team, uh, finish strong for your team, race your heart out for your team. Yeah. And the team got fourth, best finish ever mm-hmm. at NESCAX for the men's swimming and diving team. Andrew Hall, male Bobcat of the week. Thanks so much. Thank you. The women's basketball team had an eventful final few games of the season, falling to Williams in overtime on Valentine's Day despite a program record 45 points from sophomore Megan Graff. Then the Bobcats bounced back the next day, defeating Middlebury in overtime to clinch a winning record for the first time in nine years. Bates earned the seventh seed in the NESCAC tournament and fell on Saturday at National Powerhouse Amherst. Head coach Allison Montgomery recaps an encouraging season. Last year, you had a bunch of first years. 500 overall record this year, winning record, a couple more NESCAC wins. What are your overall thoughts on the steps taken from year one to year two for this for this big class? Yeah, obviously really pleased. Like, it's obviously just, you know, it's really important to keep getting better each year. And, um, you know, we had a really promising group returning this year. Um, and sort of the practical side of my thinking was like, yes, but we're still, we're still young. Like, you know, still have one senior and two juniors. And the rest underclassmen and knowing that we were going to have some freshmen who were going to need to play minutes as well this year. So, um, still young, obviously like our, our, um, you know, I was hoping for an even bigger leap this season. Um, but definitely pleased with the steps that we, we took and, um, already counting down the eight months or so we have till we play again. Well, I'm curious. I mean, you look at the four and six NASCAC record, mm-hmm. we look at some of the scores, some of those games uh, where they played out. 
It could have been seven and three. It could have been eight and two. I mean, does that is that a good feeling? Or is that a frustrating feeling? Both. Yeah. <laughs> um, both. I mean, so something that we talked a lot about this year with our team, particularly as we got into the NASCAC season, is it's now become a game of inches for us um, in terms of how much the details matter, in terms of how much po- every possession matters. And, um, you know, we took a huge stride in that where last year – um, you know, we didn't have the NESCAC record to get us into the playoffs. And some of those losses were pretty decisive um, in terms of, you know, losing by double digits. And this year we just competed um, really hard in, in pretty much every outing. Um, and so, yeah, that game of inches is um, it's exciting and it's also can be more heartbreaking in a different way. So, yeah, you think about, I mean, that weekend, um, the Williams – weekend where we lost that game in overtime had we won that game we would have finished fourth and hosted a playoff game Mm. so when you really think about the inches in in that sense like it's wild so yeah it's both it's exciting and you know kind of brutal (laughs) yeah and and hosted a playoff game obviously is is the goal getting top four especially when you factor in how well this team plays at home it's remarkable isn't it it really is (laughs) Um, And something, you know, we already talked about in the locker room after our last game last weekend is like that is a big um, step we have to take with our maturity, Um, you know, because we had a more heavy NESCAC home schedule this year and we'll be on the road more next year, especially to close the season. So we were able to end the season really strong this year um, and get some wins at home. And, yeah, I I definitely think that's I mean – there's no doubt we, we love playing at home. I think we have a great gym. We, we're all a little biased. I think it's the best gym in, in the conference. But um, I think it's also just, you know, a reflection of youth and um, just maturity and needing to have the same sort of focus and confidence um, when we're traveling. So that will definitely be something that we, we got to take a step forward with next year. So Megan Graff, end of the season against Williams, overtime game, but 45 points, a new record for Bates women's mm-hmm. basketball for points in one game. Even though, unfortunately, the Bobcats, as you mentioned, lost right. that game in overtime. But what what was working for her so well out there? I mean, it was just give her the ball and let her go to work? Yeah. She was just, yeah. She At one point, one of the officials said to me, wow, Megan is on fire. And I was like, well, that's good. If our, the official is using our best player's name by, or, um, you know, her, not her number, but her name. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, she was just super focused that game. Um, and it's not because, I mean, Williams uh, – has a really good defensive team they have some really good defensive guards it was sort of like she went through especially a stretch in that game where it kind of it kind of didn't matter um she was just able to find her offense and if she had an open look she hit it so um you know she's averaging 20 so she's finding a way to score against against every opponent um but that game she just she was feeling it Make your case uh, if anyone's listening the NESCAC for uh-huh. her for all conference. Uh-huh. Leading score in the conference. Yeah, I mean, I think leading score in the conference in such a tough conference is super impressive. Um, to be able to do that with – she has so much responsibility on our team beyond scoring. I mean, as our point guard, she facilitates everything that happens on the offensive end. Something that was amazing about that Williams game when she scored 45 is that they were full court pressuring us the entire game. So – and she played, you know, 30, you know, actually 40 minutes because it was an overtime game. So she just bears a ton of responsibility. Like she's got to um, – she had to break that full court pressure. She's got to get us in our sets. She's always thinking about, um, you know, just our team's offense. And then she also had a really good defensive game. Like a bunch of her points in that game came from, um, you know, getting some picks on the defensive end and laying them in. So she kind of does everything, which is important. Um, and, yeah, I think just as a sophomore – um, it's impressive, and I think the other thing that's that's really cool and telling is that her point average went up when we got into conference play, which you don't see that very often just mm-hmm. because the level of play is, is so much more intense and the defense is better and all of that. So I think that she was able to play her best against her best opponents um, says a lot as well. Obviously, though, basketball, there's four other players on the court. Uh-huh. In terms of number two scorer, though, Seems like Mia Roy starting to really get going here yeah, this season. Yeah, yeah. I think we had um, Mia and Ari both kind of getting mm-hmm. into averaging double figures, which early in the season, right, that was um, an issue for us just in terms of Megan was really carrying us with her scoring and just really needing more people to show up more consistently. Um, I mean, Mia was great. She just stayed so um, focused and didn't get super distracted by the fact that early in the season she was getting great shots and just wasn't hitting him she was really um kind of struggling from the field especially from three um and she just kept working really hard and um 
kept doing the same things that she was doing and and I knew that would eventually turn around for her so yeah she was um it was just super important that she she kept that mentality and and um, ended up being great for us in league, and, and same with Ari. Yeah, you touched on yeah Ariana Dahlia. I interviewed her earlier in the year. She said, you know, in high school, I was never the focus of the other team's defense. Yeah. So coming here, though, there's going to be more focus on her, right? What have you right. seen her, her development? Yeah, I think just a ton of comp. Like she's she's grown in terms of her confidence. I think. Um, she, you know, like you said, I think she's coming from a place where she was kind of the defensive stopper right. um, and comes from a really, really good high school program. So, yeah, I think the shift here of, yeah, I mean, she often for us guards the other team's best player and she is a really good defensive player. But I think also just getting her to um, think about her offensive game as well and, and not only thinking about it, but like we rely on it, like we need you to. Yeah. So we just try to focus on like your your offensive points, we want them to come from your defensive effort. So when she has great defensive games, that leads to good offense for our team. And then um, just her ability to rebound and get put backs and stuff, we really focused on that. Um, but, yeah, I think she grew a lot this year, and, and we'll look, be looking for even more next year as an upperclassman. And trying to stay out of foul trouble. <laughs> the Con College game, what, she had four fouls, and she just stayed in and hung in there, and their mm-hmm. best player fouled out. And the, yeah. That's what you want to see. And, well, maybe not the four, but hanging in there, not not yeah. you know being available, right? Yeah, exactly. Obviously, Ben's something we've been working on all year with her, just trying to – um, grow to figure out. I mean, she's a really physical player. Mm-hmm. She's strong, and she can kind of. We talk about that a lot. She can. She can draw some attention from the officials. That you know, she's going to pick up a couple in every mm-hmm. game. But we've just been working on um, sort of frustration fouls or ones where she's kind of overly physical and um, trying to cut back on those. But yeah, I think you know. And it was you know our last game of the season. Finally, was one of the only games that she wasn't in foul trouble. But yeah, that's definitely something we had to manage throughout mm-hmm. the year. And just again, another thing with just maturity that we hope will will come in that that. Sort of um thing will that that thing we have to manage will come come up less often the first year class mm-hmm. i thought it was interesting you know kayla bridgman got some minutes at guard but yeah. you mentioned before the year it's going to be hard to break through with the, yeah, yeah, the depth yeah. you have there but then the the two six footers there jenna barons brie galletta yep. at times they looked like you know one, one of the two of the better post players you, you have around in the next category yeah. what do you see from them in their rookie seasons oh my gosh so exciting yeah. i just couldn't be more excited for the future the really cool thing about them is it was so cool to kind of have both of them. They have um, they have some similarities in their game, but they also have different strengths. Um, and so we had some really nice moments this season where sort of, you know, they would both get minutes, but a certain game because of matchups or whatever was better for one of them. And so one of them could really kind of step to the forefront and have a great game. And so they traded off in that way, which was great. But I was really pleased just to see them um, make the most of those opportunities. And then also for them, I think as freshmen, which, you know, last year our freshmen didn't have this opportunity is like to kind of come in and play play behind like Tara, Taylor and Ari. So they didn't quite have the same sort of pressure and have to sort right. of grow through some things on the court. But um, – but still had really good opportunities to get game minutes and play really important game minutes. Um, so just really excited for their future. And, and they're, they're both – they both bring a ton on both ends of the court. Yeah. So excited. And then you touched on uh, Taylor McVeigh being, you know, the more experienced presence. Yeah. Every game I'm looking up, she has like 11, 12 rebounds. Maybe it doesn't score any points. But it doesn't matter, right? Her yeah. job is to box out, get rebounds. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think we're always working with her on um, – you know, which, like when you have those, you know um, – offensive opportunities like we want you to take them Mm -hmm. and not hesitate and she definitely has like a niche in her offensive game that we want to continue to develop um and because she's gotten to the point where it's not like teams can't just like not guard her like she's a good enough offensive player where um she's gonna finish open looks but yeah she's just um so good defensively and in her ability to rebound and she just brings that presence that we need in terms of um, just upper class like experience has all that knowledge on the floor about how to play defense um, and she's just she's a really focused teammate who um, yeah she just knows what to do and even when she's not bringing a lot of points to the game like she facilitates our offense in a great way like she knows um, just how to run our sets like where people need the ball like so she brings a ton and um, you know in addition to that just like her leadership and her commitment and all those things are, are pretty unmatched so we've she's super valuable to our team yeah and then this year for the second straight year only one senior yeah. uh, Mel Binkhorse what can you say about what she provided the program during her four years seems like yesterday she was a first year it's crazy it? yeah. I know <laughs> flew by I know and we've talked a lot about this the last um, couple of weeks we're just kind of wrapping up her senior season but first of all just so amazing that she you know she came in her freshman year she'd come off a second torn ACL in her senior year in high school kind of had some injury she couldn't you know she was still recovering from that her first year so for her to have 
pretty much three and a half healthy years and be able to be on the court is amazing. And she did a great job just kind of taking care of herself and, um, you know, constantly rehabbing through yeah. you know her time here so that was that's great to start with but just the growth our program has seen both on the court and you know her biggest contribution I think being like her commitment to our culture and leading our program through really kind of being you know her along with Erica last year our yeah. only senior um, really just like dragging our team through getting where we are um, it just just so so valuable so the leadership that she brought um, just just I can't say enough about how important it's been to our program. So big picture, you touched on the fact that you were basically one win away from a four seed. Yeah. The top three, you know, Tufts, Amherst, oh. Bowdoin, it seems like from my uninformed observations yeah. that what separates them is the defense and how scoring against them is just an exhausting process, right? Is that is that the goal for, for Bates and to make it exhausting for the other team to try to score? A hundred percent. And we kinda got there this year. We're like we we took a big um, big step forward. When I first took over the program, our defensive stats just made me so sad. We were bottom of the league in everything. Uh-huh. This year, we were top of the league in everything. Um, we ha- our our issue was more that even in some low scoring games, like we we struggled to score. Mm-hmm. So um, if we can put that together a little bit more, I think that's super promising because our defense just. That statistically, we were right there with those three top teams in terms of points we were holding to people to, um, um, turnovers we were forcing. We were right there. So that's really exciting, promising, and I think even looking forward to next year, thinking about more depth, and I'd love to, you know, add like a press to our game. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we've come leaps and bounds, um, but I think, you know, it's like our first game against Amherst this season um, before the playoff game. Like, we lost a six-point game, right. and it was 40, uh, 43 to 37, yeah. you know? So it's like, hey, defensively, that's not our issue. Like, we couldn't score. So, yeah, you're absolutely right, and I, I mean, I'm a firm believer that um, – defense is is what allows you to kind of stay in those those top spots yep all right well Allison Montgomery thank you so much for recapping the women's basketball season with us thanks Aaron the men's basketball team had an even crazier end to its season the Bobcats clinched a spot in the NESCAC playoffs in the final second of the regular season against then number 10 nationally ranked Middlebury on the road thanks to a buzzer beater three-pointer from senior Nick Gilpin then on Saturday Bates fell in a triple overtime heartbreaker at number two seed Colby in the NESCAC tournament Head coach John Furbush looks back on a campaign that saw Bates finish 12-13 and 13 overall and 4-6 and six in conference play. Join us on the phone, head coach of the Bates men's basketball team, John Furbush, recapping the 2019-2020 campaign. And coach, I mean, that final game against Colby in the NESCAC tournament, my goodness. I mean, have you been part of anything like that before, a triple overtime game like that where it seemed like you had Colby on the ropes time and time again, but they kept fighting back? What was that experience like as a coach in that game going to three overtimes? Well, it was, uh, it was emotionally exhausting uh, for sure. Um, you know, but, it, it, yeah, I just think it's a classic rival NESCAC matchup where – you know, you, you have them on the ropes, teams make plays, then you have them on the ropes and teams make plays again. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we just, we didn't make some shots and they did. And, uh, you know, it's just a tough way to go out. But I, I think from a competitive standpoint, guys, battles start to finish and, you know, really proud of this group. And this group included four seniors. Uh, Cody Greenalch got hurt there towards the end of the year. But, I mean, tell us about what, you know, Jeff Spellman, Tom Coyne, Nick Gilpin, and Cody Greenalch meant to this program and how they leave it going forward, kind of. Yeah, you know, I, I still, I'm still i still sort of in that emotional phase right now where I haven't uh, been able to fully separate the, the seasons over. You know, I, in my mind, we got practice today. So, um I haven't had too much time to, to decompress. But, you know, these four guys have been, uh, the backbone of our program since they stepped in here uh, four years ago. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed the time I've spent with them on and off the court. They're just great young men. And I think the, uh, you know, what we talked about in the preseason, what they did for the program um, when, when I'm not there, they, you know, they really changed our culture, the accountability of, of you know, just uh, teammate to teammate, making sure these guys are staying active in the off season and everything. Um, uh, so they've really changed our culture in that regard. But from a recruiting standpoint, uh, especially a guy like Jeff Spellman, who had multiple scholarship offers his sophomore year of high school, uh, he just really helped put Bates on the map for, for uh, you know, younger younger high school players that are thinking about the scholarship level. But 
um, you know, they see how good a guy like Jeff is and start going, well, maybe maybe I should consider the the NESCAC or a school like Bates. So um, it's it's a lot bigger than just the season that we had. I think they've left the you know, really, a really positive taste in my mouth for the future of the program, uh, not just from from the standpoint of next season, but I think in seasons to come uh, as we continue to recruit. Yeah, and well, speaking of the future, Jacob Iwowo, after basically not playing for most of the year, down the stretch, you inserted him in the lineup, and he had some big games, including 19 points at Kobe and then 13 in the NASCAR tournament at Kobe. What allowed him to develop – over the latter half of the season to give you confidence to put him in the lineup and see how productive he was? Well, I think he was uh, very opportunistic with a, a few guys that had some injuries and, and illnesses throughout the course of the year. Um, I knew right away that he was going to be somebody that could help us. Um, I think the transition from, from soccer to basketball, he had a, about a two-week span where he was unable to practice, which was unfortunately the first – two weeks of our practice so he just he missed a, a good chunk of it um but i was really impressed with with his basketball iq i mean he's a really smart player picked things up very quickly and at times he was able to run you know really the one through four for us in practice so you know once he established my trust as somebody that really understands what we're doing um and you add his you know just his physical ability he's long he's lanky you know really does a good job uh, using his positional length, um, it was really a no-brainer for me to, to inject him into the lineup. And once once he got in there, he, he did not look like he has uh, that he was a freshman at all. I mean, he, he came in and was like an immediate impact on, on both sides of the ball. So, um, you know, he's somebody that, you know, from the, from the futuristic standpoint, this kid is going to be a player for us. Yeah, and you've got two other first years who made huge impacts, Omar Saar and, and Stefan Baxter. What's the next step in their development? I mean, Saar was a double double machine when he wasn't in foul trouble, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, he is he's he's a special player for sure. He's um you know, I think it, he started to figure out how to actually like practice as the as the year went on. I think this is just uh, something he has not experienced before. Um but this kid's motor is unbelievable. He's he really understands conceptually what we're trying to do. And, and um, it, you know, he, he just – I'm I'm in awe when I watch the film sometimes about how active he is pursuing rebounds. I, I just – you know, in the moment when you're watching, like, oh, that was a really good job. And, you you know, really you watch the film, you're like, holy – I mean, this guy's unbelievable. So, um, you know, he's going to take this off season. I think he needs to definitely rest his legs. I think he's, he's pretty worn down. But from a – from an offensive development standpoint, if he can if he can establish himself as somebody that you know we can throw the ball to inside and and score one on one, that's going to just open up so much for us moving forward next year. You know we were really reliant on our backcourt this year to create most of our offense, but if we can have somebody like Omar um, that we can go to down low next year, uh, he, he's going to be a force to reckon with. And then Baxter, I mean, just seems like he ha- he had almost no adjustment period. He came in and contributed right away. What can you say about what I guess next next year though? It's going to be he's going to be kind of the guy who runs things. At least it looks like, right? Oh, no question. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, it's it's funny, you know, the, the the thing I love about my group is that um, you know the seniors we 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 would meet in the preseason and um, just catch up on things and. You know, I'd ask them, hey, how, how's, how's pickup going? How are guys looking? And they were like, uh, the kid steps really good, coach. And, and you know, for those guys to say say that, knowing that he plays a similar position, I'm like, wow, he must be pretty darn good. And, and I knew he was good when we recruited him, but I just didn't know that he was going to be this good this soon, especially with the depth of our backcourt. So, um you know, yeah, he came right in right away. He's fearless. And as a point guard – and as a freshman, for someone to really be as steady emotionally as he is on the court was super impressive. You know, he never got too high, never got too low. And, and, you know, from a coaching standpoint, that's what you want out of your point guard, someone who just can steady the group around him. So I have big expectations for stuff. And, and you know, moving forward, I think we'll have a much more traditional lineup with, uh, you know, just a point guard who, who gets us into our stuff and runs the offense, where this year we kind of had a point guard by committee with mm-hmm. the four senior guards and Stefan. So um, I think there's a lot of excitement around the transition, uh, you know, but certainly we have some, some shoes to fill with these four, four guards leaving. 
And I feel like, you know, James Mortimer had one of his best games uh, to, to finish the season there, right? Against Colby at 15 points, seven rebounds. He's going to be a senior next year. I'm sure there's some development for him, and he's going to have probably a much bigger role. I mean, he, he earned the start in this game, but I feel, it looks like at least he's going to be a very key player for next year's team too, right? Oh, yeah, James. Um, and I've said this since he came in to the program in the first year. He's, um, he's a very talented player very smart player. Um, he, he's just had the unfortunate sort of like nagging injury here and there. So you know, he was, mm. he was starting in the first few games this year, then rolled his ankle and he was out for a little bit. And then, you know, just kind of was like in and out of the starting rotation and, and just the rotation in general. But um, yeah, he's dynamite. And the one thing that he does really well with guys like those four seniors is that he just knows how to blend in and he really creates a lot of flow for us on offense. And, and now that we're going to be, you know, probably doing a lot of things through him next year. His, I think his role will change. Uh, but what I've seen of his game, that will not be a problem for him to, to elevate. So, so for this program, what's kind of the next step in terms of maybe taking a leap like, you know, frankly, like Kobe did this year in terms of, you know, win-loss record in your opinion for, for next season? What are some things you're going to be focused on? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. I think uh, – I've always gone back and forth with this as we schedule our non-league matchups. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a really fine line between making sure you schedule games that are winnable and giving your team um, a a real sense of how good they are. And so I I think the most recent polls were like the number three or four team in terms of strength of schedule. Um, So if we had had a better record, I think, you know, our, our, Chances of, of an at large uh, bid would have been would have been a lot more feasible, um, and, and you never know going into the season like that. You know, if a team last year was really good and you schedule them this year, are they still going to be good? But you know, we, right. we we played a lot of good non league teams, and so you know, as I look to create the fourteen uh, non league matchups these, this off season, I, you know, I'm going to certainly take into account the fact that um, we want to be in a position to, to get an at large if we can, and so. Uh, but we also have to find games that, you know, midweek, once Nesquite play starts, that are just not going to wear us down for the weekend play. <laughs> so I think part of that is definitely our schedule. Um, you know, we played a lot of good teams this year. But I think what, what we did, the foundation that was laid this year, was probably relatively similar to what Colby did last year in that now these guys really genuinely believe. You know, when you go and beat, you know, Middlebury was 10th in the country on the road with your back against the wall. These guys are going, wait a second, we're pretty good. And then we go up to Colby and lose in triple overtime. There's just a much greater sense of belief that we can do this. And so that when we go into next season, starting with that belief, and it's real, not just me pumping them up, um, I think it's going to just build a much greater foundation moving forward. I think it says a lot that Middlebury was 10th in the country when you, when you played them and they ended up being like, what, a fifth seed in the NESCAT tournament? I mean, that just said oh, it all yeah. there about how amazing this conference is, right? <laughs> yeah, we were, we were kind of joking about it. You know, we got on the bus and we're like, oh, we just beat the number 10 team in the country who's number five in the league, but they're number one in the regional rankings. And I'm just, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just kind of a crazy makeup. And, and, but, I, but I also think that, part of that win for us was that we were battle tested and we played a lot of good non-league teams and we lost some close games. And, um, you know, and, and Middlebury is in a position where it's hard to schedule where they're located. Uh, so they get a couple games that are a little bit closer that, you know, might not be as challenging as some of ours, but I mean, they've also beat some great teams at the same time. So um, the league's really, really good. And I would like to see as many teams get into the NCAA tournament as possible just for our, a reputation to, to stay strong moving forward. All right, John Furbush, thank you so much for recapping the Bates men's basketball season. Appreciate it. All right, thanks, Aaron. With the Bobcast taking last week off, we are offering up our lacrosse season previews after the first games have already been played. Missing some key players, including preseason first-team All-American Matt Lestava, the Bates men's lacrosse team took on number 5 nationally ranked RIT on the campus of UMass Amherst and fell 15-9 to on Saturday. Head coach Peter Lasagna reflects on that game and looks forward to Wednesday's home opener against Babson. Coach, obviously, to open the year with RIT, this is something you've done the last few years. It's an immediate challenge on a neutral field. You were without 
you know, a second team All American and, and also another key player in Otis Kling Beal. But what were your major impressions from, from the first game? And obviously, the team knows they have, you know, some stuff to work on. So we certainly do. Uh, the stats would bear, stats and score would bear that out. My main impressions, I think the most relevant comparison I can give you in answering it is comparing it to us playing RIT in previous years. Um, same amount of time to prepare, minus a scrimmage. First time I've ever gone into the first game of a season of any that I've coached uh, with no scrimmage beforehand. And I would have to say that this was the first time that I've seen evidence in this game that they just looked more game ready than we were. I, I just sort of across the board in every phase, they looked and, and it didn't look. They, they indeed were more game ready, and, and it was noticeable. How important then this Babson game Wednesday, that's huge, right, to get the team back on the winning track. No, I think it's critical. It's a great question. I mean, I look at it, and I thought a couple times this weekend, would I feel better if the RIT game was a scrimmage? Uh, and I think I probably would, so that's what I'm going to decide it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was our first scrimmage against one of the best teams in the country. Um, and so, yeah, the second game becomes critical because from Saturday after that game on, it's all about reviewing and understanding what we need to fix uh, that we saw against RIT, but then taking action to actually fix those things to get ready for a really good Babson team. I would be remiss not to ask you on the record what Matt Lestava's status is right now. Uh, I'm really optimistic. Yeah. Uh, he's made, in, I'm, I am not a doctor, though I, I pretend that I am often. Um, he's made remarkable progress. He's doing all the therapy that he could possibly do, enlisting every resource that he has. Um, time-wise and just in terms of professionals that he has access to. And he warmed up. He's been warming up goalies for a few days. He warmed up goalies on Saturday against RIT. And it was hard for me to watch him because yeah. uh, he looked good enough for me to want him to play. So I would say, honestly, I mean, I think it's realistic that we're, we're, we're pretty close. What that time frame is, is it a week? Is it 10 days? Is it two weeks? I don't know. But we're, we're the closest we've been. And then Otis Klingbeil has kind of been plagued by injuries in his career Healthy now, though, it looks like. He is healthy. Uh, he actually got his cast removed on Friday before we got on the bus to go to RIT. Has a little splint fish cast thing to just keep him safe. But he's fully functional, fully cleared to go, and today will be his first day of practice. Who are some key players who are going to have to you know, step up against Babson before you get Matt back if he's not available Saturday as well? Who are some guys who you're looking a lot to improve from maybe game one to game two to game three? Um, I think I'd probably start that answer with Curtis Napton. Mm -hmm. Um Curtis is one of the best midfielders in the country, a returning All-American uh, who has looked like a dominant player. Not, not, not just a returning All-American, but a guy who's going to move up onto a team potentially um, this year. He's just, he's just been fantastic uh, every day. And obviously he was a huge focus for RIT. Sure. They didn't let him breathe. Um, and we just need to create, but that's on me as well, we just need to create more shots for him so he's not having a long dodge for every one of his shots. Um, so I'd probably start with Curtis um, and his group which is Jack Vincey, who had, a, who had a nice game and a nice sort of return to action for Bates, another midfielder that ran with Curtis. Um, Jack Lucerarian, uh, who is a sophomore, who uh, also runs in that group. Um, Oliver Allen is going to bounce, continue to bounce up and down with, with Otis back now. Oliver may play more midfield uh, than he played against RIT. Uh, Stephen Canale had a nice goal against RIT, uh, a junior with some experience. Um, it, it's really got to be a team effort. Brendan Mullally. Sure. Um, you know, uh, a freshman named Matt Shinebeck, Shinebeck uh, who scored his first collegiate goal, but has been playing out of position for this week. We're just, we're really thin. You may well be the next attackman oh, no. uh, that, that <laughs> plays for Bates. We're just really, really thin yeah. at that position. So we've got natural righties playing left-handed. We've got a bunch of things. So, um, you know, and I, but I think, I think it's all the way around. I think that we have to, you know, anybody who plays defense for us, whether it's a short stick defensive midi, uh, a long stick midi, or a close defenseman, um, you know, everybody's got to be a little bit better than we were. Uh, and Rob Strain, if that stays, uh, I, I thought Rob, you know, outplayed a guy who many people think Walker Hare is, who's, a, who's you know, tremendous uh, and is honored accordingly every year. Uh, now, Rob saw a lot more shots than Walker Hare saw, but I also thought Rob outplayed him. So, um, boy, that forgives a lot of sins, and if we can keep him at that level, that's huge. And then... Speaking about defense, I mean, you lost a couple key guys to graduation, right? Rocco Fantoni, All-American, Stephen Bull, you know, 
huge contributor throughout his career. Who are some guys who are filling those roles now? Yeah, uh, Will Holland mm-hmm. um, was some somebody who, again, Will's played over his time, but he sort of really made himself solidly an anchor of that close, close defense group. Um, so we felt really great about that group with Will Holland, senior, Frankie's, uh, and captain, Frankie Spitz, senior, and, uh, and Will Haskell, a junior, who's gotten a lot of time over his career and is playing his best lacrosse. Now Will uh, strains a hamstring against RIT. I would say he's definitely out for Babson, uh, unknown after that. But so again, sort of the, the theme for the early season for the Bobcats is some people have to step up. And uh, we'll look at a number of people in the next couple of days and we'll see who's most ready. Same thing in the long stick midi. Uh, position we've got a lot, a lot of young guys who've got some experienced guys, um, but that just that has to be a more solid position for us than it was on Saturday. Uh, and then facing off, um, I was remiss in not uh, mentioning that the last time. You know, I think we did some good things against a very good RIT faceoff men and very good RIT faceoff wings. But I also expect us to be better. I think we've got a really good group uh, with Chris Costello, uh, a couple first year students, Peter Ackley and Jackson Williams, and, and returning senior. Jack Walsh, they all, uh, Jackson Williams and the other three all got reps mm-hmm. on Saturday and did some good things. But again, you know, against the best teams in the country, if we can be 50% or better, boy, that helps. Yeah, I actually interviewed Peter Ackley because he was doing some good things for indoor track and field yes. there before he, before lacrosse season here. He's a guy who you have big expectations for, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you know what kind of athlete he is yeah. for him to go from not running track since middle school or yeah. something uh, to getting to New England's. Um, He's a tremendous athlete, a three-sport athlete uh, from Ohio, and he is figuring it out quickly. Again, he was either four for seven or five for eight uh, on Saturday, which is pretty darn impressive uh, for a guy going against RIT. Um, so, no, we have we have huge hopes for him, and I, and I think we can be more two-headed. Chris Costello has also had a tremendous preseason, not just as a face-off guy, but as a lacrosse player, as a goal scorer, as a defensive midi, as a man-down player. I, I mean, he's just he's a great lacrosse player. Yeah. Um, but when you ask a guy to face off 17 or 18 times, it's hard to then also ask him to play offense and defense and clear the ball and do a bunch of other things. But I think we're going to be two-headed. I think Jackson Williams, the freshman, um, is also going to be really, really good in time. It might take him a little bit longer. Uh, and Jack Walsh also did a really nice job. I don't know if he was 50-50 or something on Saturday with his opportunities. But, again, you know how it is. You got If you can find a hot hand, ride it. But then you always need another one. Mm. Face-offs, that's interesting. You mentioned it's hard for them to also be, you know, on offense or defense after they handle the face-off. Why, why is that? Is it just because it's such a specialized mental challenge or physical challenge? Yeah, it's just physically grueling. Yeah. Yeah, it's feel, you're, you're, you're the man-to-man battle there yeah. for however many seconds it goes when you're actually fighting in the draw, and then the ball's loose, and then you're fighting some more, and then you're either not picking it up, and so you're chasing somebody and running around every time mm-hmm. until you can figure out how to get off the field, or you're running in and... Uh, you have the ball in your stick and you're running for your life until you can throw it to someone. Chris, we think, gives us the opportunity. The other guys do as well. Chris, I just think, is more ready right now. Um, he's a really talented, athletic, offensive player. And part of what has been most impressive to us as a staff in the preseason is Chris as a goal scorer. And so we think we have an advantage there. You know, And I've told Chris, if you win the faceoff, you stay on. We run a couple little sets just for him. But it's tiring. Yeah. And so, and if we also want him to play defense and man down, which we had him do all of those things on Saturday, he was really tired. And so we just have to be smart about managing him. Because the next second opener is this weekend, I know you're always keeping tabs on the conference. How How's it shaken out so far in terms of what you see? I think uh, the first expectations are that Amherst and Williams are going to be two of the best teams in the, college, in the league. And from feedback from people about scrimmages, uh, this weekend, I would say that is confirmed. Mm. Um, I think people are sleeping a little bit on Middlebury, who I think is, you know, they really got better and better and better as the right. year went on and uh, and return a whole lot of people from that team, and their faceoff guy is healthy. Um, I think that Tufts will be great. They lost some really important people, but, but they return a lot, and they only recruit great players. Uh, Wesleyan will be Wesleyan. I hope they'll be a little bit diminished with some of the people that they have graduated. Um, and, you know, we know that Trevor Heffel, uh, former right. Bobcat and uh, and great friend to the program, thinks that his team that he's coaching over at Bowdoin is really, really, really talented. And it sounds like they got the better of it uh, in a scrimmage against Colby. So welcome to the NESCAC. Right. Uh, a couple teams are definite Final Four teams, and everybody else is probably right below and really dangerous. All right, Peter Lasagna, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Aaron.
The women's lacrosse team made its annual trip west to begin the 2020 season, falling 19-13 at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Bates' home opener is also this Wednesday against Babson, and head coach Brett Allen gives us his take on the team so far. West Coast trip, a chance to really evaluate a lot of different players, right? Yes, and we're going to keep on watching, though, yeah. Aaron. I will say that. Um, yeah, West Coast trip, you know, the luxury of having a break this time of year right when the NESCAC schedule allows us to start is that we get to spend a ton of time together and really just connect and be together as a group which I think is something that you can't trade because it just allows you to lay a really good foundation from a team perspective um, but it's certainly from a playing perspective because it's so early you know we really use the practices um, we had a scrimmage against Claremont and then the game against Ox Occidental as just an opportunity to give everybody opportunities to play so we can really get a sense of who we're going to be um, and I think after last year with some of our graduation, um, you know, and the spots that kind of have opened up because of that, um, but also some philosophical changes for how we want to play. We really took advantage of, of that this past week and, um, and got some good looks at our whole roster, which was great. So the Occidental game, first six goals of the game go to Bates. After that, it changes a little bit. What were some things you noticed from the team? What did you talk to them about in terms of, you know, keeping that fast start going, if possible, as much as you can throughout the whole, you know, regulation? Sure. Um, well, I think in any contest, it's about being consistent, regardless of how you start or finish a game. Um, and I think certainly things were going our way. We were winning the draws. We were finishing on our offensive opportunities in the early part of the game. Um, and they were reeling a little bit just because I, I think that our athleticism and our pace of play caught them off guard. But as they adjusted to that and as they started to win some draws and get some possessions, you know, we struggled, I think, to sort of stay focused and play as well as we were early. Um, you know, I don't know if if there's anything different I would do mm. um, in the sense that we really do trust and believe in our players and we feel like we had a great opportunity to uh, to grow from that game, whether you win or lose. And certainly uh, when you take one on the chin a little bit, like you maybe think you need to grow sooner and grow faster. Um, but it was it was a good experience for us all week long. First year, Chloe Robinson, three goals. What did you see from her in her uh, debut there? So, again, we're evaluating everybody. We have her as a midfielder, feel like that's her best position, um, playing both ways. And I think she really, as an offensive player, um, is a strong, fast player who can take advantage of some situations. And uh, and she certainly did that. Um, and she's got a, a very good shot and did a nice job. And then this year your captains are um, Caroline Kerrigan, Avery McMullen, and Liv Sanford. Tell us about those three players, what they bring to the table in terms of their leadership. Sure. So um, all three have, you know, really been part of our program on the field since they were first years. Um, Caroline has pretty much been starting since day one. Liv was playing as a midfielder some, so she didn't always start as a first year. Um, and Avery was playing a bunch as an attacker. Sometimes she started, sometimes she didn't, if my memory serves me well. Um, but I think the experience that they've gained over the course of their four years really just gives them a perspective that's so valuable because you know they know what to expect when you're preparing for a game um, we also have three other seniors who I think have really done a great job of assisting them if you will as far as communicating with the team um, being consistent with the messaging from the seniors down to the um, underclassmen um, and it's been really fun to kind of watch that group of six grow into the into the people they are into the leaders they are right now and Avery had six ground balls according to the official stats in the first game that's pretty impressive uh, I had not even looked as close <laughs> at the stats as you so um, yeah I think our ride was really strong on Thursday and so we were able to create a lot of turnovers mm. um, in their transition and uh, Avery was the benefactor of that because she was in the right place at the right time to pick up a lot of those loose balls so you got another non-conference game this Wednesday Six o'clock. A Babson team that I don't know it took me off guard last year uh, when you went to Babson. What are your thoughts on this home game coming up? 
So they're a good team. They've been a good team for years. It's always one of our best games that we play from a non-conference perspective, and mm-hmm. it's an important one for our schedule because it helps us get ready for what we're going to be seeing in, in conference play. Um, they're definitely good. They've definitely got some skilled players, um, and they're probably going to be out to prove that last year wasn't a fluke. Um, you know, I think our kids are certainly um, out to prove that they're better than we showed last year when we played them. Um, and so I'm excited. I know the kids are excited and the team's ready to go. And then you get Ryan and the NESCAC action, right? Saturday? Sure. Jump right in with Wesley. Yep. And then we do have <laughs> off next week for midweek. But, uh, mm. yep, Wesley, Trinity, Amherst, and the gauntlet gets right on going. Going to California at the beginning of the year, that's something you've been doing for a while now, right? What's- well, I- I've been here long enough where it's my fourth trip to California. <laughs> um, last Going west year, yes, somewhere. Yes, right. we go somewhere every year for yeah. Feb break, um, partially because of the team perspective and how great it is to just be together off campus mm-hmm. right at the beginning of the year. Um, it's certainly a challenge finding – um, because essentially we're on day four. Like yeah. Our game on Thursday was day four of the season outside, so – you're trying to find a competitive opponent who's going to test us, give us a chance to evaluate, um, and and also allow us to build some confidence. And so every year that's a little bit tricky because you don't know what your team is going to be like when you set up that trip. Um, and I think we were really happy with how this year's trip went, um, regardless of the outcome. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously everybody likes to win, and I certainly am one of those folks, but um, – I also feel like we've had games where we've come back and won an easy one, and it didn't necessarily prepare us for what we were facing uh, once we got back. So there's pros and cons to everything, and I prefer to look at the the optimistic side of things. Sure. Well, in terms of that, you know, to have a successful year this year, what are some keys that you have in your mind, whether it be draw controls, maybe, or or ground balls, or what what's really sticks out to you in terms of you know you know having a successful year? Sure. So I feel like. Having a foundation as a group is the number one thing because that's just part of the culture that we have because if you don't have that and you're faced with some adversity, you're going to struggle to overcome it. So certainly we're working on that every day. Um, I think from a playing perspective, it's just a matter of really honing in on how we're going to play and what our substitution patterns are going to be and then obviously getting all those kids enough reps with each other so that they can really get comfortable um, and really play off of each other well at both ends of the field. Um, certainly draws are huge yeah. and those always impact the game because if you can gain more possessions through the draw, you're going to have more chances to score. Um, but I think transitions are really critical too, mm-hmm. both offensively and defensively. Um, and so we've been spending a fair amount of time on those areas and, and we'll continue to do so. All right, Bates Women's Lacrosse, home opener this Wednesday at 6 o'clock against Babson, NESCAC opener Saturday at noon against Wesleyan. Brett Allen, thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron. The track and field teams competed at some non-scoring meets over the past two weeks, with sophomore Bart Rust becoming the fourth fastest Bates runner in the 3,000 meters in program history, and senior Justin Levine moving into eighth place on the all-time performance list in the 5,000 meters. On the women's side, Senior Paige Rav set a new program record in the 500 meters and helped Bates break the program mark in the 4x400. We'll have more on the track and field teams after the New England Division III Indoor Championships taking place this Friday and Saturday at Springfield College for the men and at Middlebury for the women. The men's squash team took fourth at the NESCAC Championships and the women's squash team finished 16th in the nation with the men headed to team nationals this weekend. On the baseball diamond, the Bobcats are dealing with a number of injuries, but still prevailed 9-4 over Elmira behind solid pitching from senior captain Nolan Collins last Monday. Bates is off to a 1-4 start, same as last year, when the Bobcats ended up 19-17 when all was said and done. In tennis, both the women and men took on some tough competition down in Florida over the break, with both teams now sporting 1-2 records on the year. The women host Wheaton College this Friday at 4 p.m., while the men are off until March 11th when the Bobcats host MIT. And next time on the Bates Bobcast, we'll catch up with the skiing teams after this weekend's NCAA Ace Regional at Middlebury, plus a full recap of all the other action among spring and winter sports. Find the complete schedule of events this week at GoBatesBobcats.com. And we'll see you next time on the Bates Bobcast. Bates, 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 Bates.